Say you're me and you're in math class, and you're supposed to be graphing functions as if there were some deep relationship between y and x that your teacher just won't stop gossiping about. But, like most gossip, you really don't care about y's unhealthy dependency on x. Really, y. Get a life. Luckily, your friend passes you a note. You wait till the teacher is facing the board and sneakily open it up. And it's this proof of pi equals 4 that you've seen like a billion times on the internet, but because you're bored, and at least it's not graphing, you take another look. It's like this. Start with a circle with diameter 1 and circumference pi. Then draw a square around it. The length of a side of the square is 1, so the perimeter of the square is, of course, 4. Now you start approaching a circle by zigzagging this perimeter. This shape still has perimeter 4. And we do it again, and it's still 4. And again, and we approach a circle while the perimeter never changes. So therefore, pi equals 4. Obviously, there's something wrong here. The circumference of a circle is pi, but pi is more like 3.14 numbers and less like 4. So somehow what this process approaches is something that looks like a circle, but is not a circle. I mean, what does circle mean anyway? There's this loopy line thing, and then there's this solid disk shape. And while they're related and all, they're not actually the same mathematical object. This troll proof is so much fun, because as you repeat this zigzag move all the way to zigfinity, it approaches the shape of a circle in the disk sense, and it approaches the area of a circle, but it does not approach a circle. It's all crinkled up, and you imagine that if you stuck a straw on this thing and inflated it, that is, added as much area as you can while keeping the perimeter as 4, all the infinite wrinkles would smooth out, and you get a circle with perimeter 4 and diameter 4 over pi. In fact, you could inflate the square to get the same thing. Probably has something to do with how circles are the shape with the most area possible given their perimeter, and why soap bubbles like to be spheres, and raindrops are actually pretty spherish too. But anyway, you decide the best way to respond to your friend is to try applying the same fake proof process to something else. Maybe you can choose another irrational number, like square root 2. In fact, square root 2 would work great, because it's also a common geometry number, the ratio of the diagonal of a square to its perimeter. I mean, like, if this square has side length 1, then you've got this right triangle, and a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In fact, that's how you decide to start your proof for your friend. Take a right isosceles triangle. Each leg has length 1, so the hypotenuse is square root 2. Put this all in a square of perimeter 4. Now we can approach a triangle in the same way, and each time, the perimeter of the whole shape is still 4. And thus, by the time we get to a triangle, the length of the hypotenuse must be 2. Thus, the square root of 2 is 2. So you pass that over to your friend. Will he notice that you're approaching the area of a triangle without approaching a triangle? That a triangle has three sides, but the shape you end up with is a polygon with infinite sides and infinigon? But not a boring one, like how a regular polygon approaches a circle as sides go to infinity, because infinigons are more fun when there's actual angles between sides. Zigzagging along to make what you've decided to call a zigfinigon. You begin to wonder what other zigfinigons you can make. Maybe if you started with a star and zigged all the points in, and did that again and again to zigfinity, you get something that looks like a pentagon, but is actually a zigfinite star with the same perimeter as the original star. Or maybe you could have a rule where at each step you zig down only part way, and then your zigfinigons will have more texture to it. Maybe you could throw some zags in there, too. There's something fractally about it, except the perimeter never changes. You could do that to a triangle, or maybe make a square that turns into a zigfina square. Uh-oh, teacher's walking around. Better draw some axes and pretend to be doing math. So you turn the idea sideways and start at 0. Go to y equals 1 at x equals 1, then back to 0 at x equals 2. The next iteration is like folding this point down to 0, so the function zigzags from 0 to 1 half to 0 to 1 half to 0. The next step brings the 1 halves to 0, and now the highest points are at y equals 1 fourth. Each step brings the highest points down to 0, and the new highest peaks are only half as high. And each step keeps the total length exactly the same. So what happens when you do this to zigfinity? In one way it approaches this line, the x-axis, y equals 0. If there were any peaks, they'd get folded down to 0. Therefore, there can't be any. Yet, at each step, we have twice as many peaks. So how can there be an infinite number of peaks and no peaks? You might reconcile this by saying that all infinite peaks are equally at 0, since all peaks get brought to 0 eventually. But if everything's at y equals 0, you have just a line segment of length 2. That doesn't make sense. The length of the zigzag stays the same at each step, and at the beginning it's like 
two hypotenuse of two right triangles, so two square root two, and two does not equal two square root two. And another problem is that only peaks ever get brought to zero, but not all numbers can be peaks. Any fraction of a power of two will be a peak at some iteration, but a number like one-third, or any irrational number, will never be a peak, or a zig, or a zag, so they must all be between the zigs and the zags. But there can't be any length between zigs and zags, or else that would create a peak that would have been folded down. Somehow it has to be infinitely zigzags, in a way where there's no actual line segments of any length, but only zigs and zags. Yet, there must be an infinite number of numbers between each zig and zag to fit all the irrationals in, and somehow all the pieces of zero length add up to be something that does have length. You could imagine grabbing the ends and stretching it out, accordion style, into a line of length 2 square root 2. And then, I suppose, you could crumple it all back down until the whole length 2 square 2 line is folded up into a single point.